Well, once again, thanks so much for joining us online. This is the final week of our short series, Endless Possibilities, Endless Possibilities. And this weekend, we're thinking about what to do now. We're going to be looking at one of the most unfamiliar stories in the Bible. It's found in the book of Daniel, and a story that unfolded 2,600 years ago when the people of God were in exile in Babylon. And some young members of the Judean nobility, Daniel, and his three friends, we know them really by their, the Babylonian names that they were given, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These young men, probably between 12 to 18 years of age at the most, were forcibly deported from their beloved Jerusalem and then placed in a three-year training program in the royal household of Babylon, where King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world, living in the largest and most beautiful city in the ancient world, that's where he held court. It must have been awful and confusing, but the boys begin to really excel and flourish, and things are going rather well, until one night the king, Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. And what unfolds thereafter is a national crisis and actually a personal crisis for the Hebrew four, if I can describe them like that. So I'm going to read some verses from Daniel chapter 2 uh, that will summarize the story for us. Daniel 2 verse 1 says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And then fast forwarding to verse 10, the astrologers answered the king, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. Verse 12, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all of the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Now, over the, the recent Christmas break, I spent some time reading a massive book about the six wives of Henry VIII. Now, one of the reasons it was so massive is because he had six wives, so there's a lot to talk about. Uh, he was a great person to know if you were a wedding planner. Uh, plenty of business there, all those wives meant all those weddings to arrange. And he was a terrible person to know if you happened to be one of the wives because he divorced two of them and he executed two of them. Researchers at Yale University have recently been plowing through um, letters and comments made at the time back there uh, in history. They've studied Henry's life and they've come up with a diagnosis because Henry was infamous for his uh, temper tantrums and sleeplessness. And Yale University recently issued a, re a medical report, if you will, on this guy. And they say that they believe he had something like an NFL injury. Now, I'm not suggesting that he played for the Broncos. I mean, that stuff wasn't invented back then. But we do know that in 1524, he was jabbed by a jousting lance. You've seen those movies with the jousting, two guys with horses charging at each other with lances. I can't think of a worse way to spend a day. And the idea is you're supposed to knock the other person off their horse. And in 1524, he was knocked off his horse. And then two years later, having not learned his lesson, he was doing it again and he fell off his horse. The horse fell on him, awkward. And we are told that he was unconscious for two hours, uh, unable to speak. And researchers believe that head injuries meant that this caused Henry to be such an angry, temperamental man. I would like to say that compared to this King Nebuchadnezzar, Henry comes across like some kind of mild Sunday school teacher. This Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't into jousting, but he knew how to get mad. Three times in the book of Daniel, we read about his fury and rage. And when His Royal Highness got mad, people quickly lost their lives. Zedekiah, a king of Israel, 
was forced by Nebuchadnezzar to watch the execution of his own sons before he was blinded as a further punishment. And then in Jeremiah 29, this famous Tetchi king, Nebuchadnezzar, had two Jewish rebels burned alive, a method of execution that, of course, was resurrected in the Daniel story with the fiery furnace. So this Nebuchadnezzar, touchy guy, uh, irritated guy, and uh, he's having dreams. And the dreams are really concerning him. They're scaring him. Think of this. He's the most powerful man in the world. But he's terrified by these dreams and he can't sleep. And angry people get angrier when they don't get their sleep. And so irritated with the wise men, with the astrologers, with the consultants, and, and Daniel and his friends were appointed as members of that wise group, the king orders the execution of all of them. And um, he sends a man called Arioch, who's the chief executioner, and uh, it's believed that he was a butcher and the method of execution to be used was either to be pulled apart by horses or cut apart with a sword. Not sure which option I would particularly choose. And the executioner is now sent to Daniel and his friends to kill them and now they have to make a response. Now, what has all this got to do with us? How relevant is this as we're thinking about endless possibilities? Well, you see, this was a situation of national crisis and challenge. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of frayed temper. And in this crisis, Daniel models something for us about how to live in a time of uncertainty and crisis and challenge. He speaks to us of character in crisis. We all want the world to be better, don't we? But it was Leo, Leo Tolstoy who said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing him or herself. And Daniel shows us something of character, the endless possibilities of how we can live with godly character in the midst of challenging times. But secondly, as Timberline Church, with all of the uncertainty that we find ourselves living in with COVID, this is not a time for us to be setting out our plans and big vision for the next year or two. We've been working really hard on that over recent months, but we're sensing that right now, God is wanting us to emphasize some key areas where we can give our attention to those specifics. If you will, we can put our feet on the gas or our foot on the gas in those particular areas. Later on, God willing, we're going to be sharing big picture, big vision. But for now, here are some areas uh, that we feel like we all need to be working on. And Daniel, in his crisis, can help us with that. First of all, then, this is a time when we can be responsive rather than reactive. Responsive rather than reactive. We read in chapter 2 and verse 14, when Arioch, that's that butcher guy, uh, the commander of the king's guard had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. That amazes me. Daniel responds rather than reacts. Have you noticed how quickly we can panic in crisis? We, we don't think about a response. We react and, and I'm, I know it happened here as well. The COVID crisis hit. And what's the first thing we did? We dashed out and said, we must buy toilet rolls. Toilet rolls. Um, as far as I understand it, and I don't want to delve into the medical complexities, but as far as I know, no further supplies of toilet rolls were actually needed. But someone somewhere said, I think we might need more toilet paper. And the word got out and somebody else said, please don't buy, don't binge buy toilet paper. We have plenty. And everyone says, wow, they're talking about toilet paper shortages. We better go out and buy 374 packs of it right now. And what did we do? We created our own crisis concerning toilet paper. Why? Because we reacted rather than responded. Someone has said, when you're seeing extreme responses, 
It's because people feel like their survival is threatened and they need to do something to feel like they're in control. What did we do? Toilet paper. Daniel could have just reacted, but he didn't. He could have been a little clever with his words, acerbic, sarcastic. How dare you, Arioch? Don't you know we're members of the Royal Academy? Don't you think you should double check with the king to make sure he really wants us dead? Perhaps he was just venting. He just had a rough night's sleep. Do you really want to take that risk? Or, or he could have reacted with a threat. You do this to us, Arioch, and, and God's going to get you. We'll make sure of it. Or even an escape attempt. Run for your lives, boys. We're doomed anyway, so let's take our chances. But instead, Daniel used wisdom and tact as he talked to the would-be executioner. And it's not just the content of his words that were measured. We're told that he was tactful. The word means tasteful. It speaks of subtlety and appropriateness. Something amazing transpires here because suddenly the executioner is talking about his own anxieties and fears because Daniel's response has won his trust. When we go through challenges personally, when we feel like we're in the middle of crisis in our wider world, let's ask God to help us to respond and to act and speak wisely, to be prayerful, not to just say the first thing that comes to mind. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Amen to that. And let's also be open and responsive to the Holy Spirit. More about that in a moment. But those astrologers, they said to the king, Daniel 2.11, no one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. See, that was their problem. Their false idols were dead, and they had a belief that the idols weren't really involved anyway. They don't live among humans. But Daniel had a conviction that God was with him and for him and able to speak to him. Let's not live our lives believing in God, but living as if no God existed. What a challenge. Secondly, let's take responsibility for ourselves. We read in verse 16, and Daniel went in. He stepped up. He re requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. I mean, that was really dangerous with his majesty, the hothead. Maybe Daniel thought, well, I'm going to die anyway. But, but please know that if Daniel had got this wrong or had got on the wrong side of the king, he risked horrible torture before death if he made the king mad. But here's the thing. He shouldered responsibility and he took the initiative. Surely we've got to know that this is a time when we need to take responsibility for ourselves. If church for you, for me, is a vague habit, our spiritual lives won't survive this season. We've got to take responsibility and have roots in God and take the initiative for our own lives. This is a time when, of course, we've had to deal with lots of limitations. Uh, and we've been in a situation where we can't just be, we can't just move into the temptation of being on autopilot with church. You know, you just show up at the weekend, you sit in the seat that you always sit in, the one that Jesus gave you, and you, you haven't got to really think too much about everything, and, and, and we come out here and we we uh, talk to you about the Bible when you sing a few songs, or maybe you don't, uh, and, then, and then you go home, autopilot, cruise control. This is a time when a lot of that has been taken away, when we've had to grow up and take responsibility. Sometimes outside of crisis in the 40-something years that I've been a pastor, I started when I was five. Sometimes during that four decades, I've heard people say stuff like, well, I'm just not being fed. That's an interesting comment, isn't it? I'm not being fed. Who is it that needs to be fed? It's normally small children, babies, and those who are so advanced in years and battling illness that they are no longer capable of feeding themselves. We're not just about 
coming to church to be fed. We've got to take responsibility. Daniel shouldered responsibility, took the risk. Let's take responsibility for ourselves. Thirdly, let's be sure to connect. We read in chapter 2 and verse 17, we read there how Daniel was part of a supportive spiritual community. We read, then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Meshiel, and Azariah. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Bednego. What does that mean? It means that we need to invest in our friendships and take, again, take responsibility for them. But it's, this is just more than casual friendship, you know, just flipping a few burgers together, socially distant, or whatever the restrictions will allow. Daniel was part of a supportive, prayerful community. Church matters. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was martyred, uh, he said this, in, in living as he was in uh, a Nazi prison, facing or experiencing what it meant to live on death row. He said, the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. Eli Weasel, who was a prisoner in a, a Nazi concentration camp, he noticed that the Nazis tried to get the prisoners to just forget others around them and live for themselves. It was his observation that those who formed deep friendships and who lived for one another, they were far more likely to survive. Hey, when all of this COVID stuff is over and we probably will probably never want to say the word COVID again, don't drift into a, well, yeah, my church is in the mountains, isn't it? I, I, I just got used to this online thing and I don't need to be part of the community of believers. Don't drift into that. We need each other. Starting next weekend, we're going to begin our series in the book of Ephesians, which paints such a beautiful portrait of the church on how, and shows us how God doesn't just save scattered individuals, but rather calls us together. God has always been about raising up a people, not just persons. Community is not just something that we need. Community is something that God prescribes for us in Scripture. And it could be that in this last year of, of challenges that some of us have just drifted out of, or drifted away from seeing the priority of church. And this is a time to connect and to build friendship. Uh, perhaps if you've not been part of a, a small group, however small groups can meet, to make that connection. Fourthly, let's listen to God and listen to others. Because you see, God spoke to Daniel. Daniel 2 verse 19, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. It was a throwaway comment that created quite a reaction. I'm not a regular um, uh, watcher of The View TV show. In fact, um, I don't have time or inclination to watch too much daytime television. And I have a personal conviction that if you watch too much daytime uh, television, it will probably drive you completely bonkers. But nevertheless, it was during The View that Joy um, Bihar, an actress and, com and comedian, she said, uh, she said, it's one thing to talk to Jesus. She said, it's another thing when Jesus talks to you. She said, that's called mental illness, if I'm not correct, hearing voices. And of course, there was uproar because what Joy was saying, she was suggesting that anyone who would think that God might speak to them must be having mental health challenges. God is not silent. He is not mute. And he speaks to us through his word and he speaks to us by his spirit. And Daniel postured himself to be a listener to God. We know that he prayed three times a day. And so when a law was passed telling him that he couldn't do that, he prayed three times a day, just as he always had. That was a, a discipline that was established in his life. Let's be open to listen to God. And in, in this coming year, we want to especially posture ourselves as Timberline Church to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit as we gather together. 
not getting into weird stuff, but just being especially hungry to hear from God and be sensitive to his voice. Years ago, um, many years ago, in fact, um, I had a dream. It was a, I, I dream, I think we, they tell us that we dream every night. We just don't remember them. I remember a lot of my dreams and most of them are, are just completely incomprehensible and ridiculous. I often refer to my dreams as being the garbage disposal of my daytime brain. I'm not sure whether that's true. But I had this dream, it was very vivid. I was standing on this railway station in England and uh, I looked around and the name of the station was Pemberton Station. Pemberton Station. And I was talking to somebody on the platform and they were telling me all this stuff about someone called Pemberton. And I, I woke up and then I went back to sleep and I think I dreamed it again. And I got up the next morning and I felt very strongly that God said to me, today you're going to meet somebody called Pemberton and you're going to tell them what I told you last night while you were quiet enough to listen because you happened to be sleeping. Well, up until that point in my life, I had never met anybody with the surname Pemberton. The chances weren't good and I was due to speak to a leadership group of 50 people and they'd all pre-registered for the course. So with great excitement, I looked down the list. Would the Pembertons or Mr. Pemberton, Mrs. Pemberton, Miss Pemberton, would someone called Pemberton, a dog called Pemberton, would someone with that name be on the course? There was no one. So I thought, great, it was the pizza. So I drove to uh, where the course was being held and uh, went in and... Um, and was just about to start the day when a couple rushed in at the back and they said, we didn't sign up, we're really sorry, we heard about this, but we'd like to sign up for the day. And I said, oh, that's, that's no problem, what, what's your names? Mr. and Mrs. Pemberton. I mean, my hair always stands on end, it's just the way it is, but my hair stood on end and they must have thought I was rather weird because I said, well, welcome to the course. And I had a dream about you last night. They're probably thinking, hello. And during coffee, I was able to share with them what God had shown me. And they said, this is absolutely incredible. I've stayed in touch with the Pembertons. In fact, Mr. Pemberton is now with the Lord these years later. But that night, God spoke to me. Now, that doesn't happen every day. And I've just got to say, as a pastor, over the years, God has not been as talkative as I thought he would be. But there are these moments when God can break in and speak. Let's adopt a posture of being open and listening to him. And let's also listen to each other. It's a shouting culture at the moment. Let's listen to each other and not just talk and declare our views. Don't be one of those people who endlessly finishes other people's sentences. It's been said that if you listen to the conversations of our world between nations as well as between couples, they are for the most part dialogues of the deaf. When we listen to each other, we are saying you're, you're important, you matter, your opinion is worth hearing. Well, the last thing is this, and that is find avenues of sacrificial service. We read in Daniel 2.24, then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon and said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret his dream for him. This was the crunch moment. He'd, been, he'd asked for time from the king and now he had to put his neck on the line literally and serve. And there's something we could miss here because he appeals for the lives of the other wise men. And if you look later in Daniel, it's some of the wise men who conspired against Daniel's friends. We don't know definitively that they were the same ones, but what we can see here is Daniel stepping up to serve. Dietrich Bonhoeffer again, he taught that servants are people of active helpfulness and by serving, we can make an impact on the world. Can I make a statement that I 
I've thought about and prayed about this week. I am convinced the way that we behave right now at this junction moment in history will determine our ability to be able to declare the good news of Jesus, perhaps for the next 10 years or so. And serving is a way in our communities, in Timberline, through Timberline, serving is a way that we can make such a difference. Andy Stanley, as I close, Andy Stanley talks about how the early church made such an impact without technology, without TV or radio. I think they didn't even have Facebook. They didn't even have the ability to post pictures of their breakfast. Nevertheless, they impacted the world. And Andy Stanley says they gave their service, their money, their goods, their time, their safety, their creature comforts, their reputations. They gave to their own, but not just to their own. They scattered good everywhere, freely, indiscriminately. They had no expectation of payback. They loved the unlovely. They crossed over the street like good Samaritans. They looked for sweaty feet to wash and went even further. When terrible plagues hit and huge swatches of the population fled the cities, abandoning the sick, the Christians stayed behind, nursing the ill back to life, which meant that some of the carers died in the process. This was no holy huddle. When pagan priests fled, the Christians cared for the sick pagans, many of whom converted to Christ unsurprisingly. Serving serving and it might simply be that serving you know that gentleman who lives just down the road from you who lives by himself and he hasn't seen anybody for weeks it, it, it might be that a, a card through his door or a phone call and can i pick up some groceries for you it could be that a kindly phone call yes it can be about participating in a program and thank god for our amazing volunteers here at timberline but it can be about making ourselves available to simple acts of kindness that no one will ever write down but can actually change a life. So, as we think about endless possibilities, with constrictions and restrictions, as Daniel experienced, because by the way, his lockdown went on for something like 60 years or more, never ever returning to Jerusalem, but in those challenging circumstances, he discovered the endless possibilities of being responsible and responsive, listening to God, connecting with prayerful community, serving to the best of his ability, God helping him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you because you use ordinary people. Nothing else is available. It's us. And we thank you for the privilege that we have of being your people at this time. Would you cause us to be a people of wisdom, of response rather than reaction? A people who take responsibility for our own lives. We want to listen to you. Speak to us. Teach us more about what it means to hear your voice, to be confident in hearing you and then committed and responsive when we do. Help us, Lord, to be those who connect and take responsibility for connection, celebrating and valuing the body of Christ, the family of God. Thank you for the joy of being part of the Timberline family. And then, Lord, help us to express our faith as we serve, perhaps serving through programs and volunteering, but then also having a servant heart in the way that we go about our lives. As we do this, help us, we pray. We ask it in your name and for your glory.